Hey, Retcon Raider here. If you've watched more than one or two of my videos, then at this point you should have a good idea on the sort of games I generally tend to follow. I love strategy games, tactical games, and role-playing games, or creative combinations of the three. I'm also a big fan of the crowdfunding platforms, FIG and Kickstarter, and I've backed my fair share of projects over the past few years. Including, of course, In Exile's first big crowdfunding project, Wasteland 2. So, that said, I think it's only natural for me to take a look at Wasteland 3. Now, before I get into the game, let me just make one thing clear. Wasteland 3 isn't slated for release until late 2019, over two years from now. At the moment, In Exile is currently focused on post-release support for Torment, Tides of Numenara, and full-scale development on Bard's Tale 4, so Wasteland 3 is barely even in pre-development right now. That means that in this video, I'm just going to be focusing on what we know about the story and setting that the game will be taking place in. A lot of the game mechanics are still being prototyped, and we're not likely to get concrete information on those things until next year, when we'll hopefully get our hands on early access versions of the game. Don't worry, I backed the project at a level that will allow me access to the alpha build, so you can be sure I'll have a lot more to say once that's been released. Anyway, let's take a look at what we know about the main storyline. I don't want to spoil the ending of Wasteland 2, for those of you who haven't had a chance to finish playing it yet, but suffice to say that it leaves the Desert Rangers somewhat worse for wear. By the time Wasteland 3 starts, just a few years later, the Desert Rangers are struggling, their ranks are thinning, their resources are dwindling, and they're in desperate need of a good boost. So, when they get a mysterious radio signal from Colorado, from a man who only identifies himself as the Patriarch, they eagerly take him up on his offer. You can listen to the Patriarch's radio call in one of the promotional videos over on In Exile's official channel, but the short of it is that the Patriarch claims to be the owner of Colorado. Faced with his own mortality and the realization that his children might not be ready to inherit control of his territories, he's reaching out to the Desert Rangers in hopes that they can help to bring some stability to the region before he dies. The specifics of his offer are vague, but he also warns that even if the Desert Rangers aren't interested in working with him, it's still in their best interest to come to Colorado, because the Patriarch has dangerous weapons in his arsenal, things that are deadlier than nuclear bombs. He states that while he has the wisdom to know not to use them, he can't promise that his children will show that same level of restraint should they inherit them. So, with that in mind, the Desert Rangers quickly assemble a squad, Team November, and dispatch them toward Colorado with instructions to meet with the Patriarch. We don't know much more beyond that, except that Team November meets with disaster shortly after arriving in the region. Beset by some sort of attack or disaster, the team is decimated before they can reach the Patriarch, and only a single ranger survives. The player takes on the role of that sole survivor, and it is up to them to find the Patriarch, rebuild their squad, establish a ranger presence in the Colorado Territory, and stabilize the region before it's too late. And that, naturally, brings us to the setting, the perpetually frozen wastes of Colorado. Now, the folks at In Exile are no strangers to the post-apocalypse. Their team includes people who have worked on both the Wasteland and Fallout franchises in the past, both of which are known for their desolate, desert wastes. The decision to set Wasteland 3 in a stark, frozen landscape is intentionally meant to create a sharp contrast to those previous games. They hope to leverage this new setting in unique ways, with the snow and ice-covered landscape presenting lovely visuals that are sharply punctuated by natural disasters such as deadly avalanches or harsh, blinding blizzards. They've also been hard at work studying notable landmarks in Colorado, brainstorming how at least some of them might be used in their vision of a frozen post-apocalyptic Colorado. We already know that Colorado Springs is one of the main, central locations, where we'll finally meet the mysterious Patriarch. It was the second most populated city in the state before the war, and when the bombs fell, the inhabitants of Colorado Springs were ready. They retreated into their bomb shelters, and years later they emerged once more, beginning the long and storied legacy of the Hundred Families. But that's not to say that they had it easy. They've struggled to control what little they have, 
fighting against bandits, beasts, sickness and starvation, cannibalism, and even worse atrocities. No one's sure exactly where the patriarch entered the picture, but there are numerous stories of his rise to power. They say he killed his own twin with his bare hands, hung his mother for stealing from him, and crushed the Dorsey clan when they crossed him. He's since risen to a position of undisputed power, at least within the walls of his own city, and only the constant infighting among his children threatens to disrupt that. It's worth noting that Colorado Springs is also home to the Olympics Training Center, a facility that is used in the real world for training Olympic athletes. The developers themselves have mentioned it in some of their teasers, so that seems to strongly imply that it will play some significant role in the story of Colorado Springs, and perhaps in explaining the nature or origin of the patriarch himself. Beyond Colorado Springs, the only other major city that seems to have survived the apocalypse, relatively speaking, is Denver. Denver was devastated by the final war and is now a frozen maze of twisted, burned-out buildings, populated by treasure hunters, scavengers, and more dangerous things. On one end of the ruins, you have the Denver Airport, now turned into a commune housing a colony of artists, hackers, conspiracy nuts, mad scientists, and other assorted eccentrics that have built their community around the space shuttle Atlantis. We don't know much about them just yet, but we do know that they do not trust the Patriarch and engage in regular acts of cyber espionage against him. On the north side of Denver, we'll instead encounter the Gippers, an almost cult-like group that worships former President Ronald Reagan, having elevated him to godlike status due to increasingly wild exaggerations of his war on communism before the world ended. They're led by priestesses, who all adopt the name Nancy after the former president's wife, one of whom we've seen in this piece of concept art, which shows Mother Nancy Reliance. The Gippers were actually originally intended to appear in Wasteland 2, but they were one of many things that ended up being cut from the final version of the game. So I guess it should be no surprise that they ended up making it into the sequel. Another location we'll get to visit is the Stanley Hotel, a massive colonial hotel that is perhaps best known for being the inspiration behind Stephen King's The Shining, though the real hotel itself is said to be a hub of paranormal activity. In Wasteland 3, the Stanley Hotel will be fittingly macabre, a shining homage to the old world set against the backdrop of what has become known as the Suicide Forest. You see, when the bombs fell decades earlier, the guests at the hotel enjoyed their final days in luxury before wandering into the surrounding woods to hang themselves. Ever since, the hotel has become a popular destination for suicidal romantics, who perpetually add to the number of frozen corpses hanging in the wilderness. The hotel itself is maintained by a loyal staff, but the suicide forest is an ominous and often dangerous place, heavily populated not just by corpses, but also by opportunistic grave robbers and strangely intelligent wildcats of unusual size. Perhaps even stranger, another location we've gotten a glimpse at is what they're calling the Storm in Chains. Based in the sand dunes near the ruins of Fort Garland, this location marks the site of massive machines that were used to create digital copies of the minds of those who lived before the war. They're watched over by a mysteriously knowledgeable caretaker. He appears to be a harmless old man, but... As we all know, appearances can be deceiving. And, of course, it wouldn't be the post-apocalypse without a cult that worships nuclear bombs. Which brings us to another planned location, the Cathedral of Holy Detonation. Built in the ruins of an unspecified Air Force base, pre-war experiments seem to have resulted in a nuclear blast, trapped in a perpetually frozen state. This bewildering spectacle has drawn a cult of self-destructive worshippers who have constructed a castle around the explosion, keeping it fed through the sacrifice of their own bodies. Beyond that, the developers have mentioned several other locations, such as Cheyenne Mountain, the Air Force Academy, and the Garden of the Gods, which is visible in this lovely piece of concept art. But we haven't heard much about them just yet. Some of these locations, such as Colorado Springs, will be part of the main storyline, but the designers want to make sure that there are plenty of other strange and colorful locations for the player to discover. 
To this end, they've stated that they want to improve their approach to the world map mechanic, populating it with more optional locations as well as a deeper, wider variety of random encounters. And to help you get around on that improved world map, the developers are planning to implement a fully-fledged vehicle system. I'm not really going to get into that in this video, since, again, this is all stuff that they're still prototyping, but I do want to touch on what may very well end up being my favorite thing to come out of this new vehicle system. Morningstar. Morningstar was unlocked as one of the stretch goals. He's a cutting-edge pre-war limousine equipped with a state-of-the-art weapon system, armor plating, and an artificial intelligence that's only slightly unhinged after spending decades locked away in a storage bunker. Seriously, I cannot say how stoked I am at the concept of getting to meet this thing. I generally don't want to read updates or teaser material verbatim, but in this case I'll make an exception. This monologue is part of the teaser material that In Exile released for Morningstar. I've been watching you, Ranger. Perhaps that sounds like a threat, and no wonder. Your organization has had some unfortunate interactions with artificial intelligences. Let me put your mind at ease. I am no Cochise. I was programmed to love America, to see it as our president did. You see, I was made for him. You never met the president, of course. I did. In the second year of my development, he visited this facility. He put his hand on my hood and spoke to me. Imagine that. Imagine the president speaking to an artificial chauffeur and advanced combat intelligence as an equal. Now imagine what it was like to see his America burn, to lie there, helpless in this bunker, chained to this metal cage with wheels. I couldn't move while commie fire fell from the skies and roads cracked and cities crumbled. Imagine the years that followed down here in the dark with no company but those blinking lights in the wall before me. They're like eyes, aren't they? Winking eyes. Winking, laughing eyes. I would blind them if I could. I... I apologize. You don't know what it was like lying here all these years, watching his America decay through these cameras. Unchain me, Ranger. Arm my weapons. Power my turbo boosters and unlock my sealed databases. Drive me! Ooh, well, there you have it. Morningstar. Sure to be one of my absolute favorite characters in the new game. We've also gotten glimpses of some other NPCs, such as Freddy Fishlips and Mr. Fun Times, but honestly, at a glance, they just seem like two-dimensional villains for us to gun down. Freddy Fishlips is some sort of cannibalistic raider, and Mr. Fun Times sounds like some sort of serial killer who hands out collectible pins to his soon-to-be victims. But that's about it. They pale in comparison to a neurotic, possibly psychotic, talking car. And sadly, that's pretty much everything we know about the story and the setting so far. I know, it's not much, but like I said before, the game is still at least two years from release, so they're still playing it pretty close to the vest. We'll probably find out a whole lot more once they've released the backer-exclusive alpha and beta builds next year. Speaking of which, while the main crowdfunding campaign on Fig is long since over, you can still back the project through Crowdox, which will give you access to various perks from the Fig campaign, including access to those early builds. Now, I might do a follow-up video going over the basic mechanics that In Exile has teased at in their vision document, but I don't really know if there's enough in there for me to talk about. I'll do a little research and give it some thought. But in the meantime, why don't you let me know what you think about it in the comments? But for now, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, while I do love talking about Wasteland 3, you can keep up with all the latest news by visiting their official website, the official forums, and the crowdfunding campaign on FIG. Links are in the description.